So I own the Tulsa Toy Depot and Honeysuckle Chocolate and Candy. They're kind of a dual concept. They actually both operate within the same sp space as the same store. So um, Tulsa Toy Depot, um, I opened up in June of 2015. And then Honeysuckle Chocolate Candy is a new concept we kind of created um, just at the beginning of last year, at the end or the beginning of 2023. Um, before that, though, I go way back to where I've um, the actual LLC we operate uh, that I operate the business under started in 2007. I've done things like frozen custard and slider burgers and and other kind of things uh, in the past. It kind of taught me a lot as we moved into these things and kind of, you know, found found our best niche for the location we loved and the neighborhood we loved. That's perfect. Yeah, we have a similar story there. Yeah, this business, Free Mind LLC, it's uh, yeah. started in 2008. Yeah. And it's just so, it started out booking bands and I was doing street work and stuff like that. And here we are. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's one of those things that it was actually just awesome. I was just thinking that I was like, I've I've operated an LLC for over 16 years. I've made payroll every two weeks. I have paid all my bills on time. And I'm like, there's probably a really low percentage of LLCs out there that can say that. I, I can I guarantee you that I guarantee you that I was actually uh, a couple of different conversations today and it was starting to hit me. I, I was doing the math. I was like, oh, man, it is a long time. So especially when I look at my uh, my house and, and the kids and everything like that, I'm like, man, only one only one kid was around. So. <laughs> and, well, and, and so much of that is is uh, it's not because I'm I'm a genius. Uh, it's not because I'm smarter than other people. It's not because I'm just maybe like even a harder worker. Sometimes it's luck. Sometimes it is like you literally have to. You have to be willing when you own a small, small business. There's people that have small businesses and it's like, but they're like, they got 40 staff and they got two people working HR and they've got two accounts. I'm like, you're, you're really, you, you have a small business technically, but small, small businesses are ones where, where uh, it's you, like you are the accountant, you are the payroll, you are the guy that designs the store layout. You are the one that um, has to be there if somebody's sick. You know, and so in those small, small businesses, um, it really is one of those things where the, the biggest thing you need is like you have to be willing not to have to work hard all the time. But when you need to work hard, you have to dig down and work hard. Otherwise, you don't make it 16 years. You're exactly right. And I'm periodically going to hit the mute button because uh, because we're joking around about lawn mowing. I think I laughed too much and the, our neighbor's mower just went out. So now he's going to, now he's outside the window. <laughs> so <laughs> we might have to mute every once in a while when he comes around with his mower. You're good. He, must, he must have heard us. He's a, uh, he's a, he's a keeping up with the Joneses kind of guy. He must have thought yes. I was going out to mow later. <laughs> so uh, talking a little bit about Tulsa Toy Company. Now I have. Toy Depot. Sorry, Toy Depot. Sorry, Tulsa yeah. Toy Depot. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that, and uh, and and uh, I think it's somewhere. I think I've I think I've uh, been a customer of yours before when I was in the area. Awesome. Um, well, it wouldn't surprise me. It's fun. Some of my best conversations are the customers we get in the store that come from out of town that are traveling through. Um, maybe they're in visiting friends and their friends. So you got to yeah, go to the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. There was an induction ceremony. Okay. Yeah. And so what, it's really cool because sometimes it's it's maybe you're in town and you're like. Hey, we want to find a toy store. Maybe mm -hmm. you're you've got friends and they're like, hey, you got to go check out the store. Let's go here. And I love meeting people. I love it when people are like, this reminds me of a store in my town uh, or a store I love. So um, what it 2015 is when we opened. 2014 is kind of when the the uh, dream or I, I tell people I was like, I must have just had something bad to eat the night before, but I woke up and I was like, I think we're gonna do a toy store. So I had uh, we had, we had had a chocolate. Uh, candy concept since 2010, a, a national franchise and part of the space. But the majority of the space, we we're actually leasing and still an open concept um, to another uh, retailer. And I knew in 2014 that a year later when their lease was up, they weren't going to stay. They had had some challenges in their family and having two locations, this was their second was not going to work. So I was like, do I want to try to lease that again and really have little control over how well they do, if it's being run well, if they're going to stay, or do I want to take control over a concept there myself? So again, I have a little more control over the direction and the the stability of my company because we rely on having using this whole space. And uh, my dad had passed uh, about four weeks earlier, so he was very um, like active as a supporter for me in the business. He would come in all the time. Really miss not having him there, but at the same time. I was like, well, we've got to, I, I can't sit here and 
and dwell on that forever. I have to figure out something to keep the business going. And uh, my brother and his three kids live like a mile down the street from the store. And so I was like, you know, what? let's give those three kids a toy store. They were like seven, five and one at the time, I think. And I was like, if anyone else comes in, that's just a bonus. And so um, I started researching um, like children's toy stores um, had been in retail, food service, fast, you know, kind of fast food. Um, so I knew the retail angle, but I really didn't know the toy industry at all. Uh, at that point in time with my candy and chocolate, I was really ordering from like three vendors and I'm looking at toy stores and I'm like, wow, that, these toy companies, there's like 200 different toy companies in these stores. You know, I don't have time to call. That's a full time job just to call an order and learn about all these products, stuff like that. So it was one of those cool like there's moments you have. And as you walk away from the moment, you're like, wow, like um, I was meant to be at this place at this time. So I did a lot of research online. But then I was um, I was like, I need to go see some other toy store. So in Oklahoma City. Uh, Norman, about two hours away from me, there's a toy store in each of the towns. And so I was like, I'm going to go down there one day and just visit those stores and kind of get a feel for what they're doing. Maybe pick pick their brain a little bit. And so I decided for some reason, go to the store in Norman first instead of the Oklahoma City store. And I go in there that morning and um, part of in the store, they had this huge Brio train set up. Most people who are listening are familiar with Brio classic wooden trains. And there was a staff member, at least I thought a staff member, that was like kind of helping kids engage and play in that little play area. And I started talking to her as I was looking around and she goes, well, I don't work here at the store. And I was like, really? And she goes, no, I actually work for Brio. She's like, um, I rep them and about 40 other companies. And she's like, there's about five reps that live in Oklahoma that rep all of these toy companies that you're going to have in your store. So you only have to really get to know five people instead of 200. They're going to be the experts. They're the ones you lean on to know what are the trends, what's selling well from those lines. How do I navigate through a small phone book worth of a catalog from a toy company and everything? And it was just like, and I told her about my experience owning an LLC, being in retail, food, and like she says, you know everything else and stuff. And so from that, it was just like, all right, let's go. Um, so I literally designed the store in my head. I had brought some of the toy reps into the, uh, the business when it was still operating as this other business. And then we'd meet across the street and I'd say, this is what I want it to look like. Is that going to work? They said, that sounds good. And then it was so cool because after we opened a year later, they would all come in and they're like, this is exactly what you said it was going to look like. I said, I know because I could see it. That's just one of those things that God's given me. I'm not good at a lot of things. There's a lot of things I'm not good at. But there are some things I'm good at and I'm very visual. Uh, I can see things and I can remember them. I have a very good visual recognition memory, which has helped me a lot. And I could see it was going to help me a lot in the toy industry because um, we have about 10,000 items on the shelves at any given time. Um, and so we created the store. I spent a lot of time researching. Um, I would at night, I would just get online and I would just Google uh, Toy Stores Ohio or toy stores, Indianapolis, and any toy store I could find online that had a website, I would go to their website. I would look at every photo they had uh, on their Facebook and their website. I would look at any listing of toy companies. Then I would make a note. I would go to that toy company's website, see if I liked what they were carrying and start making a list. So, I mean, again, it's one of those things that um, I, I didn't try to create this from nothing. I said, there's other people that have been doing this a long time. Let's go and lean on their knowledge and their wisdom. Um, I lean, I've lean. i leaned on knowledge and wisdom for the la from the last 16 years from good and bad decisions and lean on everyone else. So many people, when they start a new business, they want to uh, they want to go uh, and they think they're they just got it all figured out. And uh, they think they're like the first one that came up with ideas and stuff and that whatever they came up with is going to work. And it's like, no, it's. It, you know, like there's no there's no harm in going and leaning on other people, looking at other things, seeing what's worked and what's not worked. And, and again, gathering as much information and data as you can, because it will probably help you a lot. Because if you own a small business, you're putting everything into it. Uh, you know, you're putting your this. This is how you make money. You know, um, I joke that I'm you know, I'm 100 percent commission based, you know, and that's basically what you are. If you own a small business, you work 100 percent on commission. And uh, and stuff. And so you want to try to get it right and you want to, you know, check every box you can and look, research as much as you can.
But at the same time, it really doesn't take that long to do the research now in the world we live in today. Well, and, and Ryan, for you, I mean, kudos to you for going right to the brokers and right to the sales reps right off the bat and being like, you are the the beacon of understanding of the market. And I'm not going to try to pretend not to be that. I know what I'm good at. Like this, I've, I've dealt with thousands, literally thousands of retailers in my life in wholesale. I can name probably 10 in my life that ever I knew about asked anybody else's outside opinion, not mine, not, not only my opinion, but just any opinion before they did their business of who was on the street and who was working the market. So, you know, that's a truly humbling experience. And obviously you knew you were going to reap the rewards of, of going that route. It's uh, it's really good. And even now I still lean on like when, the, when it comes to the reps, there's certain lines like when it comes to dolls, I, I love having a lot of dolls in the store because my grandmother loved dolls. But when it comes to ordering from Corel or Madame Alexander's like that, I completely lean on the rep. I literally say, here's what we sold in the last year. Here's my here's my report that I emailed you and what our inventory levels are. You you're the expert. Yep. You're a, a mom. You work. You rep the company. Um, you're a female. Um, that's who my, buys my dolls. And so you put the order together for me. And this is how much I want to spend. And then I don't. Yeah, I, I let them go and I let them be the expert. Um, and also just kind of you have to just trust your instincts too. Um, a lot of times we have these, you know, great conversations in the store with customers like maybe yourself and your agent and say, wow, you know, it's a really great mix of products you have in the store. You did a really good job with that. And I'm like, I just ordered in what I liked. Because the reality is when it comes to marketing, I have a marketing degree um, and stuff, but you learn pretty early on that 90% of us like pretty much the same stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, and also, you know, too, that before a toy ever gets to market and gets put by these companies, they're running these toys by hundreds of people because they're going, you know, because if they're going to make something, they're going to probably start out with 10,000 units. They're not going to do that unless they haven't done the research. So, again, leaning to understand there's other people out there. I'm not the greatest one ever. Um, you know, I was thinking like, you know, there's there's people out there, especially in the food industry. You'll get a new concept you'll run across and you'll go into and uh and stuff and it started because some guy um thought he came up with the greatest hamburger ever <laughs> and stuff and it's like well yes you you think you have the greatest hamburger ever and your wife thinks you have the greatest hamburger ever and your parents definitely think you have the greatest hamburger ever uh and stuff but um you might just have a good hamburger and that's probably what you have because the reality is that most people are going to say that's a really good hamburger but there's a lot of good hamburgers out there so just because you think it's the greatest. Most people think it's going to be good. So it doesn't mean that all of a sudden you are just going to sell these faster than you can ever sell them and uh, and everything. And that's part of the reality check um, that I think a lot of people have to realize, like, you know, um, I am I'm not the greatest. My idea. I'm not the first one to come up with an idea. I need to run this by a lot of people. I need to do a lot of things. Uh, you know, years ago, back in 2010, when we started um, with a, a candy candy chocolate franchise thing that we did for 12 years until the end of 22. Um, uh, when we first started talking to the company, they uh, gave us, they, uh, um, they gave us our number, uh, their numbers, like breakdown as a public company, we had to give their numbers for like what their sales were for, for each store. And I think the natural reaction when people look at sign up for a franchise and they get those numbers that, you know, data sheet of, you know, 200 stores, 300 stores, whatever. And here's what the sales are, you know, for store one, two, and three is everybody naturally um, looks at the top ones and says, Ooh, we could do what those top 10 stores are doing. Uh, my dad and I, it was so great to have a sounding board with him, someone next to me that could say, uh, no, you don't have the greatest idea. You need people around you that can do that. That can be honest with you is we looked at the bottom 20%. And we said, can we make money if we're in the bottom 20 percent? And we knew we could and we figured it out. And we're like, yes, we can make money. We literally never looked at anything above the bottom 20 percent and stuff because we you want to be realistic and uh, and stuff and realize that um, as great as you think everything is. And we see this, too, with the a lot of the toy manufacturers. A lot of guys will come up with really great new ideas on toys and stuff. You're like, it's really great. And I know you're passionate about it. Literally, it's like your child. But um, everyone else doesn't think that it's going to be as great as you think it is. They're not all of a sudden going to stop buying everything else or buy yours in addition. And so that's the biggest challenge I think I see with like 
small businesses, storefronts, and uh, and some of these these uh, in the toy manufacturers, some of the food concepts too is is sometimes the people behind it are just um, so in love with it is they they get tunnel vision, they have trouble hearing other voices, and it ends up financially um, ruining them down the road. It's um it's 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 a really challenging thing for a lot of people to to understand. I, I jokingly call it the American Idol syndrome. When you when you're an amazing singer in the shower and you're an amazing yes. singer in the living room and then you get on stage and you choke, but no, <laughs> it's it's or you get just a dose of reality. But um, and we've all been there. I've been there met numerous times on on uh, life and the universe giving us our doses of humility. But I, uh, talking about the importance of understanding the market ahead of time, I was talking with uh, Lucinda Wright of Cask and Kettle the other day, and um, she was talking about when she launched Kashi and things like that. How, how much they needed to reach out and how much they needed to understand and going to get distribution, how much they spent ahead of time. And I just really appreciate what you're saying and also your your advice to others is that you don't have to spend tens of thousands of dollars on focus groups. Just find people that have differing opinions or are your target demographic, but you have to get outside of your inner circle of trust. Yes. And you have to expose yourself to the potential that somebody's going to tell you dog shit. Excuse my language. <laughs> so, yeah. No, you have to be willing to tell you here. Well, here's the perfect example. Oh, I'm willing to tell you baby's ugly or something. <laughs> I'm a child of the eighties. There you um, go. And, and so um, I always tell people that the greatest movie decade of, of ever was the eighties. And, uh, and so I had a great, great marketing device. I've never forgotten literally from when I was a kid. And it comes from the movie Rain Man. You familiar with the movie? Yes, you're good. We're, okay. we're, we're the same. So you we're the same exactly. You're good. <laughs> so Charlie Babbitt uh, was um, was Mr. Cool back then and stuff. Everybody wanted to be Tom Cruise and stuff like that. And his brother Raymond is infatuated with Kmart. And the um, you know he just goes on and on about it. He wants to go there and stuff. And eventually, Charlie just has to step in and say, Raymond, K, you know Kmart sucks. And it was that wake up call and Ray got it after that. And he realized yeah, Kmart does suck. Now I always picture, I'm like, what was it like in the executive offices of Kmart the week after that movie came out? <laughs> like the coolest man on the planet at that point in time, like Tom Cruise, you know, risky business, Top Gun, you know, Dustin Hoff. I mean, like it doesn't get any cooler. And he's just told the whole world that you suck. Well, the reality was what happened was um, he was speaking some truth. Kmart really, really did suck. It wasn't a good, it wasn't an enjoyable um, retail experience, but it took um, that to happen. And so, um, you know, it's one of those things that you need that outside voice to step in. And sometimes that outside voice is someone very close to you. And uh, I always encourage my brother is kind of that sounding board I have now with my dad not here. And so I always run to eyes as him. I'm like, you know, hey, if this sucks, tell me, like, be brutally honest with me. And uh, stuff because most of the decisions I'm making, I'm literally I'm putting my money on the table, not someone else's, and uh, and stuff. And so you need that. Um, and then also it's encouraging too, like when it comes to retail. Um, you know, I mean, we've been talking about like the death of brick and mortar, especially small business, small independent businesses for for 20 years. And the reality is that's never going to happen as long as there are creative people out there, because. Um, what we are doing in retail is we are creating an experiential experience. It's an experience in our store. It's not just some place where you go buy something because it's cheap. So there's really going to be two kinds of retail going forward. And you've already really seen it. You're going to have a few very large companies, Walmart, Costco, and Amazon that are going to do very well because they're going to be able to sell you what you need. Um, maybe a cheaper version of it, but what you need for cheap. To where it allows you to spend money on your family, pay your bills, maybe take your family on a vacation. And then there's going to be uh, the other side of retail, which is going to be local independent stores that create an experience. And so you come in our store because you enjoy the experience. And uh, and that's the other part that Kmart got wrong is that um, they were they were getting beat on price by Walmart and their experience sucked. It wasn't an enjoyable store. And so they were in the middle and there's nowhere for that middle anymore. You're either going to be um, one of those big three and uh, and you're even seeing Target really struggles because they're they can't do it on that. And the experience in Target is, is it sucks. So what you're seeing is a small and you can probably think of ones you visited. Um, 
you know, and I love when I go in these retail store experiences, I mean, I'm thinking of like Lindell Candy Company that I stopped in in Texas uh, last month or Square Books in Oxford, Mississippi. I could literally live in there. Um, I've, been, I've been there only to go there. <laughs> yeah. And so that's the thing is those are the ones that are doing an incredible experience. That's our goal is to create that experience in our store to where you experience it and you enjoy it. Um, and if someone's listening right now, you want to think about what, when's the last time you went into a retail store, brick and mortar store, and you took the time to thank the employees, the staff there, um, for how wonderful their store was or how much you enjoyed your time in their store and stuff. If you can't think of that, then you're not getting around enough because they are out there. Every town has them. Um, if you do experience that, take the time to tell the staff that you enjoyed it. Um, that's one of the blessings in our store. We we have created, a, the goal is to create an experience. It's an experiential store. Like uh, back in, uh, when I was in Dallas Market in January at the beginning of the year, you know, one of our magic uh, vendors, Marvin's Magic, they had a guy there at the booth that was doing the tricks. And I'm seeing him do the tricks. I'm like, this is, you know, this is really fun just to watch him do that. And um, I was like, my manager, Shane, can do that. Um, he can learn those. So I told my rep, I was like, let's do this order. We're going to send and Shane's going to learn how to do that. And I knew Shane would not me. That was it was going to be he's the one gifted to be able to do that. And so he does that now. And I get kid, every day I'm in the store and Shane's not there. All of kids that will come be like, do you know any of those tricks? This tall guy did those tricks. <laughs> and I'm like, Shane will be here the rest of the week. Come in then. And so, again, it's that creating that experience or creating the way you do your store, the the murals, the kind of wood, the kind of music. Um, we've got a giant train on the building. I remember when I first went to this store, I was like, I'm going to put a big 12 foot train engine and come off the end of the building. I don't know how I found a wonderful person to do it once I figured out I wanted to do it. But again, it's better creating that experience. And so we get people every day that love that experience. Um, and stuff. You know, I remember when I said I wanted to open up uh, a toy shop and stuff, my mom was like, well, wh why would you want to sell toys? They sell toys at Target, which is a mile down the street from us and uh, and stuff. I was like, well, we're going to sell different toys, better toys, and we're going to create an experience that people are going to enjoy and they're going to desire that experience and stuff. And so that's what's really worked because, you know, we were already selling chocolate and Target also sells chocolate, but people were coming in our store quite a bit. So there must be something about the experience they enjoyed. So that's what you've got to do. And you don't have to spend a million dollars to do that. Um, I really spent outside of the inventory, like what you see in my toy store when you, people are looking at photos online. I spent about $20,000 for the shelving, the murals, the paint on the walls, the big 12 foot train on the building. Um, and then even my POS and like literally everything outside of inventory, I spent like $20,000. Um, you can go sign up with franchises and you pay a gazillion dollars because they're not they're not being smart at all. You know, they're charging you five times what you need to be pay, paying for a POS system. Um, they're charging you. They're making you do certain signage that just is overblown. Uh, they're making you use shelving that doesn't look good and costs three times what mine costs and uh, and stuff. And so, you know, if you're an independent store, it doesn't take too much time at all. Um, I've given advice to plenty of people I've talked to over the years that how to like do things um, on a budget, but not look cheap. Like you can make things look good without spending a ton of money, which matters because that's that initial investment that you're looking to get back as you make money over the years in the store. And so you don't want to dig yourself a really deep hole, um, but you've got to create that experience. Um, and if you're if you're a small business retail store and you suck, you're you're in trouble. Um, your goal is my goal every day is, is to create an experience that doesn't suck. The uh, I, I, I like that. That's that. Is that tell me that's a bumper sticker you guys are selling? We need to. It's uh, <laughs> it's not. I just I, I I just went to Tulsa Toy Toy Depot and it didn't. It suck. doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> suck. I mean, you you would have a thousand cars in a week. <laughs> it's uh. No, it's that's that's the goal is to do that. I mean, I like even little simple things like we have a great every week at uh, Thursdays at 11. We have the greatest story time lady, I think, in the country. So Miss Carol comes in. And again, it's just little things like that, like creating that experience. Not everybody comes to that story time. Not everybody can enjoy it, but they know, oh, that's a place where they do a story time. And even when you're not there during it or um, and stuff, you just know this is a place that has a vibe and a feel to it because they do things like that. And that was very simple. I literally just 
looked, we had a local kids magazine in town. Every town has them. It had a list on a page of all the story times and stuff. So it took me no time at all. I literally looked at the thing and every single one of them was a, like a library or a, or a uh, government type situation where it's taxpayer funded. They, who knows what they have, but then there was one for-profit story time at uh, Pottery Barn Kids. Um, on the other side of town. And I was like, well, if Pottery Barn Kids is doing this and their job is to make money, uh, then they probably have someone pretty good. And so I had been promoting it for about six months that we were going to put in a toy store in there. And I had had that list. And I was like, I got to figure out who that person is that does that one and stuff. And then one day um, this lady comes in the store I'd never met before, comes up to the counter and uh, on, the, on my chocolate counter there. And she's like, I see you're opening up a children's toy store and it says you're going to have story time. And I looked at her and I said, you're the one that does story time at Pottery Barn Kids. She goes, yes. And so she was doing it there on Tuesday. That's what we did on Thursday. But she brings her guitar. She plays like all your classic preschool songs. She gets the kids up dancing. They do like 20 minutes of that. It's like, I would say she's like the Mick Jagger of three-year-olds <laughs> and stuff. And then she gives them a little sticker on their hand afterwards. Sometimes her husband, Bruce, will come and play the electric bass and, uh, and stuff with her. So, you know, little things like that. Um, you know, we have a Santa day, the first Saturday in December, all of our customers, we just promote it to our customers and stuff. It's just a thank you every year. The best Santa and Mrs. Claus that come in and sub in for the real Santa, Mrs. Claus, of course. And so um, we set up a great place for them to do free photos, interact because we don't try to bring everyone in town in and we just want to be a thank you to our customers. It's not real crowded. So where you maybe have one or two groups behind you to where you have time to talk to Santa and create that experience. And, you know, we have kids now that we've been for nine years now, be our 10th Christmas in December. Um, we have kids where literally that is the only Santa and Mrs. Claus they've ever met. And uh, and just little things like that. And again, not everyone gets to experience, but, but even the ones that do, don't that don't get to know this is an experiential store. It's a great store that feels good. Um you know, on top of the fact, I mean, you know, I have a retail store where we have customers that literally um, start kicking and screaming and throwing a fit if they have to leave the store. Of course, they're usually like three or four years old. But I mean, how many people have a retail store where um, literally you're, like we hear a kid screaming, the parents of the group are like, oh, I'm so sorry. We're like, no, that's good. We know they enjoy the store because <laughs> they desperately want to stay and, uh, and stuff. But we have tons of adults that are like, I'm so glad the store is here. Um, I enjoy the experience. It's not just the products on the shelves, but it really is the experience, the free gift wrap, the fact that we're helping them find, you know, when they come in, you know, they'll, they'll, we'll say, well, you know, who are we shopping for though? It's my, you know, my, my grandson, he's four years old. And so a lot of times my first question is, well, well what is he like? And a lot of times they'll start out and they'll say, well, he likes to watch this show and that show and this movie. I said, no, tell me what your four-year-old is like describe them like what are they what are their interests like what kind of personality they have okay let's go to that section of the store um and so you do all that um the best experience again it's all about creating this experience in brick and mortar now is um uh, back go back to 2020 from it seemed like that's like 20 years ago but so 2020 um what we did is again our goal was to create an experience and help you kind of just get that like best hour of your day, best thing you did all day was our store. That's our goal. And so um, when everything started happening in March, um, we we were in Oklahoma. We, we didn't have anyone outside forcing us to lock our doors. So we didn't lock our doors. Um, and what we did is we um, we didn't um, put a bunch of stickers on the floors. We didn't throw a bunch of plexiglass all up over in the building. We did simple things. We got rid of all our demo areas for the time being because um, so to where, you know, there wasn't a lot of things being touched by a lot of different people and stuff. But our goal was we, we knew everybody knew six feet. We knew everybody knew to respect each other. Like we didn't, they were being told that 24 uh, seven, you know, it was just incredible how much we were getting inundated with all that. So we said, let's just treat when they come into the store inside, let's just act like it's normal. Let's treat everything normal. Let's not talk about what's going on outside. And we would have people come in. This was in, you know, even in like May, June, July, even in August. So even like, you know, what, five, six months after everything started, and things were pretty normal in those places. We would have people that would just browse the store and shop on their own for like an hour. 
Um, I'm thinking about the last time that people said, I have an hour that's worth it to walk around a store. And then we literally would have people at the end of that, they might buy something, something they didn't. And they would come up to us and they would just say, thank you so much. And they said, this is the first normal hour I've had in five months. And to know that like you gave somebody the first normal hour of their life in five months. And like, you know, cause they felt like I can't, there's, I'll get my life back at some point. Things will get normal. And it was so simple. All we did was just treat people normally, um, respect people's distance at a, at a you know, certain level. And, and we didn't have any signage up. We didn't have any plexiglass up because we knew the people that would, that wanted the plexiglass up weren't going to come into our store anyhow at that point in time and so let's for the people that didn't care if there was plexiglass up or not let's give them that experience let's let them have a normal hour of their life and we did that in 2020 and people loved it um and they blessed us um that year because of it and especially the next year because of it but again that's the key thing is give people a normal enjoyable experience uh help them remember their childhood maybe if it's a toy store or whatever it is um but you know again like you can make retail really fun and really enjoyable um and you don't have to build bass pro shop i think um i appreciate your focus on experience because being in the industry of consumer packaged goods and retail as long as i have as well we've all seen where it became providing for the customer meant a proliferation of SKUs. Mm -hmm. so it was it was never about the experience the experience was choice and the the abundance of choice and I really respect and admire your position on experience being the actual human connection. Yes. I, I, I could, uh, well, it's funny too, our store looks full. Um, it's got 10,000 items in there. There's uh, people like, how do you pick? Well, the nice thing is there's, uh, there's a really great selection in the toy industry. I've only been there nine years. Um, I've been looking at it for almost 10 now, but I mean, uh, the, uh, there's way more I love that I run across than I can fit in my store. And so, you know, I could triple the size of the store, but I would lose the experience and, uh, and stuff. And the reality is I'm still giving people a really good mix of products and they see it and it's a huge selection for them. And I have to understand that from my point of view, is it a huge selection? Some days I think, well, it's not as huge because I know so much about the market in the industry and i know what's out there but for them it's overload just to come into our store and to see the product mix we currently have that's overload for them and uh and stuff but i don't sacrifice the experience again if we got too big we would sacrifice the experience um you know we'll get customers from time to time mention toys r us that's a good example in my industry um of a place that um they started they at one point when i was a kid like in the 80s it was a really cool store. They had some experiential there. And then at some point, their leadership, which always amazes me, um, I own this little business. I mean, I have six employees right now. I mean, we are a small business and uh, and stuff. And uh, I meet so many people like uh, that I've come across over the years, or I see them on TV or other places that are like corporate CEOs of publicly traded companies or large companies like Toys R Us. And they're really just not very smart. Um, and they really like I, I don't know where they've been living, but they haven't been living in the real world. And I don't think they know any real people. And so they they have trouble like doing things that actually that real people want done. And Toys R Us did that. They um, they you're, thought you're, you were you're speaking my language and keep they like, thought they could go against like yeah. they thought they could go against Walmart. They're like, yeah. OK, well, what do we have to do? Because Walmart um, and Target we're kind of the first two that started to, to say, okay, we're going to be toy, toy areas and toys are like, Oh, wow. They've got a lot of toys. And some, some idiot in their office said, well, their toys are priced uh, better than ours. So we need to match them on price. Well, if we have to match them on price, then we're going to have to cut back on labor and a whole lot of other things. And, uh, and then Amazon came in later, but this was all happening before Amazon started selling toys really even and stuff. But the problem is when you have to cut back on other things, uh, and stuff, um, then your stores start looking poor. Uh, if you don't have enough labor, then you don't have enough staff to go and straighten the shelves and put things back where they need to be, which I can tell you, like, uh, you know, sun Sunday, we had, uh, we had a large, we had like, it was a, there's like a, a 
this is not far from they had like a party room so when they were done with the birthday party every family from that party came to their store so we had like 30 people in the store like five o'clock on sunday and a lot of them are little kids so they're obviously going to take things off the shelf and you know knock them on the ground or move them somewhere else and they're like my staff came in you know uh on monday morning they're like what happened in here i was like i didn't have time to clean all this up <laughs> uh, but uh again that's what happened in toys rush you cut back on your staff now your store isn't organized now it's not even clean and then eventually it be, starts to become filthy. Uh, I remember talking to my brother about the time when they finally shuttered all the Toys R Us's. And uh, I, I told him, I was like, I haven't been one of those in years. He goes, yeah, I had, the last time I went, he goes, it was the filthiest retail store I'd ever been in and stuff. And again, so um, that's just like, it goes back to that like key point. Don't suck. And that's what Toys R Us started doing and stuff. So, you know, again, the only there's only really three Walmart, Costco, Amazon. That's it. That are allowed to basically just like, they can just focus on price and stuff like that. Everybody else has got to uh, have a good concept that people enjoy going into. Uh, otherwise you might as well just turn into a warehouse distribution center where you ship things out and don't even let people come in because they're going to come in there and you see your store is filthy and they're not going to like it. And, uh, and stuff. What? Well, um, I can we're in the, we're from the we're from the same generation so I'm going to ask you how did how much uh how much influence did Big have on your aspirations for opening a toy store? Um I love that movie. Uh <laughs> it wasn't one that kind of came up then but I did. Oh, I love that movie and uh and stuff and um I kind of I always when I watch that one I'm like gosh I don't know if I would have gone back. Like you 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 created our 12-year-old dream like <laughs> Yeah, like Dude, he had a really good life. He had like a really nice penthouse apartment in New York. He had a really good job to just like play with toys and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, he had it all figured out and uh, and stuff, you know, and, and that goes back to even, uh, I mean, it really wasn't, I think it was an FAO Schwartz in New York. Yeah, was Schwartz, Schwartz, yeah. Yeah. So if they had good leadership, what they would have done um, is they would have figured out how do we create an experiential store like this that only takes up um, maybe 2,500 square feet? That's all we have to rent. We and we're going to go money. and we're going to go put a hundred of these in the hundred nicest shopping centers in America, like outdoor shopping centers, you know, like a Highland Park Village or something like that. Um, and if they had been able to recreate the experience in a 2,500 square foot and had a hundred stores that were generating revenue and making money, and then they could have probably even had some exclusives on some really good toy companies and stuff like your your really inventive companies like today or like uh, Plan Toys or Fat Brain or people like that. Uh, they could have done that because the 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 toy industry is producing great product, but they never were able to figure that out uh, and uh, and stuff. And you had they would have had to have that because the the Manhattan store. That's one of those things that you can create a really cool experience. You can never generate enough revenue to pay for that operation there because of the cost of it. But big was great. The other one that's really, that I love doing too, again, it comes back to realizing if you own a small business that um, you're not the greatest at everything, you need to understand like your strengths and your weaknesses and understand what you're weak at and, uh, or what you're just not interested in maybe. Um, and so I love um, trying to help, um, match things up together. Maybe it's products, maybe it's people and saying, this is where that person goes. Well, this is what that is. And then let them run with it. Um, you know, like I'm just not into doing social media myself. My staff is, they run with it. They're doing all that. Um, so whatever it is, helping other people go with things and, uh, and, you know, trusting them to do that. I love just like matching things up. I love helping find you know, um, maybe it's even helping another small business like, hey, you know, you need to connect up with so and so, you know, you need to call this company. You'll really appreciate knowing them, maybe working with them. Um, and that comes back to my other really favorite 80s movie, which people. So um, in Ghostbusters. Yes. So in Ghostbusters, this is a really important point. They think it's a bad idea. I realize from the very moment I hear it, it's an incredibly great idea, which is they they run across the gatekeeper and then the key master and they're like we probably shouldn't get these two together and like i'm sitting there going no we have to get them together <laughs> and if they don't get these two people they're meant to be together and if you don't get them together we lose the greatest scene of the movie which is up on the rooftop of the high rise and stuff 
And, uh, and so, you know, that's one of those things too, that um, I love doing is even when it's not my business, just um, sometimes whenever I'm traveling, I always stop in small businesses. If there's a candy shop, if there's a toy store, if there's a bookstore, um, or sometimes it's just other places and you love connecting people. I love telling other people about them. Like you've got to know about this place. This is a great place. And just, it's just connecting, uh, making all those connections, helping people out, um, whatever it is. Uh, you know, again, I ended up visiting three toy stores. We opened ours. Um, I've helped others since then, like give them tips and stuff. One of my, uh, or even just finding things, uh, there's a toy store and, you know, um, one time I was in Dallas market, we got the regional market for us is in Dallas. And so there's a toy store there that's been there forever. And so I just stopped in there after market one day before dinner. And, uh, and I had like, we were, I was actually meeting a friend like in the same shopping center for dinner. And I, um, but I always stopped there to kind of get ideas. And so that time I said, what's the game company you can't live without? And I already had a lot of games in my store at that point. And so they're like this one here, we can't live without Seth. Seth's got like five crowns is kind of their most popular game. Um, and, and some other ones, it's like a card game company and even the packaging, it kind of looks a little dated and stuff. And it doesn't look fun. It's maybe as fun as some other things on the shelf. They're like, we can't live without this one. I was like, I never even thought about that and stuff. And uh, so I brought them in since then. I have regular customers. There have been regular sellers ever since. But again, it's just finding all those connection points, meeting people. The more you know, the more people you know, um, and uh, and everything. So, like, I'm on the board. I'm on the board for a ministry down in Hugo, Oklahoma, Southern Rural, Oklahoma. Uh, that's a Christian ministry day school. You know, so they're they're doing like uh, boarding kids that stay there, live there full time too, and stuff. And so I'm like watching TV last night. I run across a place in Texas that's doing a very similar thing. And so this morning I shot off an email to Chris said, Hey, I saw about this place in Texas. You ought to connect up with them um, because I bet they'll be a good resource because they're doing a really similar ministry to what you're doing. Um, you know, when, when I started, uh, when we started working on this day school, I said, you need to come spend a day up here in Tulsa because there's a place up here in Tulsa that's doing a very similar school that you're doing with lower income kids and stuff and so we spent you know a day with the with the headmaster at the school and now they go back and forth all the time talking to each other and brainstorming ideas about you know a lot of different issues that i totally am foreign like i have no idea how to run a school um i have no idea to do all the all the stuff that they do and that that's not my uh that's not my lane but i made sure i saw two people that worked in that lane and made sure they knew they existed so they could talk to each other um, and that's so important um, in so many different areas. I have fun doing it, but um, that's, uh, you know, like it's, it, it helps. The more you know, um, the easier all this becomes. You, you, um, you speak in my language as well. Even when I'm traveling, I, I always, uh, I always stop and I always ask, I said, who's the, who's the owner here? And uh, a lot of times people get, I can tell that people don't do it often because most people are like, why do you want to see him? Or who, where is she? Or whatever. <laughs> And they come out and they're waiting for me to pitch something. And yeah, I am a salesman by tr by trade my whole life, but I'm not there for that. And I always like, I just want to say thanks. And they're like, what? I'm like, just, I know it's hard, you know? And, and that's, then, that's awesome. Like, it's so good when you're doing it. You I face. know when I'm in the back of the store and someone comes back and says, <laughs> they're asking for the owner. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, do I go out that curtain or do I out this back door? Does he have a briefcase or a video camera? What's he? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, uh, you never, you never know. I know like even, uh, uh, even like back in like, I remember back in 2020, I actually, I actually had a broken ankle. I was laid up at home with a broken ankle in March of 2020 and stuff. And I'm literally, I felt like I was calling my in mid March when everything really started going weird. I felt like I was calling my staff like every hour going, okay, scratch what I just said. This is what they're saying. <laughs> but I remember when we were kind of debating like, okay, do we, do we lock the doors, you know, and stuff. And, uh, I was like, no, I've, I've read the declaration. I, I, I've read the constitution. I was like, we can allow people are free to come in or not come into our store and stuff. So but I remember telling her, I was like, if the national guard shows up, put them on the phone, I'll talk to them. But, <laughs> but other than that, I was like, no, yeah. but again, yeah, it's always fun when it, when people go out, cause it's a shock. If you're a small business owner, like you get people coming and trying to sell you stuff like credit card processors, all the other sales, marketing, 
uh, magazines still exist, radio still exists. People <laughs> try. And so when you have someone that goes out of their way to say what you just said, Nate, like, thank you. I love your store. I appreciate what you're doing. I get it. Uh, all those things like that. That's awesome. Uh, you know, because everybody. Do it. It's not hard. You know, it's not hard. It goes a long way. It's, you know, what they always, you know, you always heard the, the, the illustration that it takes less muscles to smile than to frown. And it really does, which is what always shocks me because um, you, you go online now, you know, everybody's a food critic now um, and, uh, and stuff. And it's like, no, you, again, you're, you're not. Uh, uh, there's, you know, somebody that's paid by a magazine to, you know, taste food and study or a newspaper or, or, or Portman or something like that, you know, Portnoy. So that's it. Like those are the, it. everyone else, it's just your opinion and your opinion carries the weight of your weight and that's it. Uh, but they make the effort a lot of times to criticize and not make the effort to say it takes so much less effort to tell someone how good they're doing. Even when I go into a retail store that I can, I feel like, man, they're, they're missing it. They're not getting it all the way. Maybe what they're doing is not being done right and stuff. I try, I always, always make an effort to find things they are doing right. And whatever they are doing right, I tell them because I want to encourage them because those are the areas I want to make sure they keep doing and uh and stuff so but it's important you, you see that i mean i've walked into food i can walk into a food restaurant like a new concept even if it's like a national thing and i can tell if it's going to be there and literally like I'll, i can literally pinpoint i'll tell like my brother it's like that's going to close in nine months or that one's going to close in two years and literally i'll be right within a month and a lot of times it's just you walk into the concept i can take it in really quickly I can see, okay, I paid this much for a meal. It took two people this long to prepare my food. This is some of the, I can see their overhead. I can see their labor cost. Uh, I've been in the food industry. I know what their, their uh, food costs are and stuff. And so you can see, okay, yeah, um, they can't turn enough. They can't, you know, do enough revenue here or at least in this location. And from what I'm seeing to make this work or they can, and it's going to be here for 10 years or 20 years. And uh, and stuff. And so much of it is just you know, like you see that and some people don't get that. Um, and it's one of those things I tell people, if you want a really small, if you want to open up a little storefront, you have to be someone that wants to run it. Um, you know, if, if it's it can't just be a hobby. Uh, I had I had a guy years ago, I forget, came in uh, at the, the chocolate counter I was talking to. And uh, he's like he's like a financial advisor, investor, kind of like person like that. It's not like someone's like, you know, in finance and stuff. He's like, well, we've got a group of investors who we're looking to like invest in like a like a like a restaurant or a food concept or something like that. Like just put money into something. And I told him, I said, there's this thing called the S&P 500 and you need to put your money in that. Uh, because if you're not interested in being involved, just put your money in that and make your nine percent a year on average and 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 move on, you know. Small businesses are people that love it. Like we don't do it um, to get rich. We might get rich. We might end up, people might love our concept and we end up franchising it into a hundred stores or a thousand stores down the road. You know, Quick Trip is an incredible convenience store gas station operation that started in Tulsa um, and, uh, and stuff not far from where I live. So, I mean, you never know what it'll become, but if you start it with the goal of just trying to grow it in some massive franchise and go public, and then go live in Palm Springs. That's not why you need to get into small business. You need to get into it because you love it. Because if you don't love it, and then when it gets really tough, you're going to quit. Um, you're not going to push through that hard part to get to the other side of that challenging time of the season in your small business. And uh, and that's what you have to have. Again, it comes back to, like I said at the very beginning, you have to be someone that's willing to work hard not that you'll have to work hard all the time, but if you do, you have to be someone that's able to do it. And some people just aren't. I um, I'm gonna we're gonna I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna close this part off of the of the toys because I wanna I wanna do chocolates. I wanna do another episode just to chocolates with you. So I'm, I'm really I yeah yeah because I really I know that they're both very separate, but they're also both very intertwined. And I know personally, I can spend a lot of time in the chocolate world as well. So um, I definitely wanna. Uh, I actually have some friends. Um, in that world too. I'll actually maybe talk to them and see if they want to do like a round table talk or something like that about that. That'd be kind of fun. My, um, my old mentor is, uh, Ben, Ben McLaughlin, his family's, uh, he's third generation of the Wolfgang chocolates family. 
Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so uh, he actually he lives here down the street from me, and I'll I'll see if he might. He doesn't. He he he. Uh, I might see if he wants to join in, and maybe we just do a three wheel on chocolates alone, and just talk about that. That's what's been so great. I mean, like for me, we've we've moved into where we don't actually make any product. We're like, there's people that do stuff better than we could ever do it here. Let's just sell their product here um, because they're all over this country. They make great stuff. Let's promote them just like we've been doing with the toys. I can't make toys, but other people make really awesome toys. Well, it's yeah. amazing. Like um, in 2020, that's when we were still operating our franchise chocolate shop. Um, and so we had we kind of could compare our numbers month to month with other stores around the country. And they had a location in the Mall of America. We did the same sales sales in 2020 as the store in the Mall of America. Nice. So that should, you've been to our store, you know our location. That should mm -hmm. never happen. Yep. But again, it shows you like what COVID did. Again, if you're in certain situations, and this we've learned over time too. Again, um, sometimes you know when it comes to brick and mortar, it matters where you are, and you have to look and say, okay, how much can I be affected by the macro and things that are completely outside of my control? that could damage my business beyond recovery. Uh, and do I really want to put myself in that position and that situation? And that's something that's really smart because it's very uh, tantalizing to go and, and get in some place because of the current traffic or current things that are there, but that, you know, might not last forever. And you, you're, you're setting yourself up for some instability long-term because you're relying too much on everything going on around you um, and, uh, and not just on your own concept. No, and you, I, I appreciate that, and, and I have to, I have to make one joke about myself. I, when I wrestled in high school and, and growing yeah. up towards the tail end, I wrestled heavyweight, and my, my wrestling coach and I, we went to, we went to the, uh, the Hall of Fame, and this is when I came by and went to your place because, I, ha we were always joking around about being the heavyweight on the wrestling team, and him and I are like, are going to this, the Hall of Fame for a friend of ours who was being inducted. And I said, I, I don't think I could be a heavyweight uh, and not stop at this chocolate store. On the way oh, there. yeah. <laughs> and that's how we ended up in there. And I just think it's so funny that coincidentally we're having this conversation now. <laughs> well, no, it's so it's so funny, too, because I get the one of the biggest things you get is uh, people would. It, it's funny. You're like, what are they what are they saying about me? Because I'm standing behind the counter. And they're like, I'd be 400 pounds if I worked here. It's like, well. Am I? I'm not 400 pounds, <laughs> and I work here, so help me out. You know, but it's uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it's one of those. Or people will say, I, I think I'm gaining weight just looking at this. It's like that's scientifically impossible here. Right. So, like, you know, <laughs> uh, so that's not possible. But it, you know, again, it's uh, it's uh, it's cool. Yeah, I'm glad you got to be in the store and uh, everybody. I missed you when I saw the email. I was like, I, I don't know who Nate is, and and uh, so. I appreciate uh, Ryan. I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah. Well, we're gonna we're gonna have a lot more conversations, and I'm working eventually on a uh, on a road show to do follow ups on site in different places that I've done those. So I'll keep you posted uh, when I do that as well. So yeah, let me know because my passion really is I uh, because of the way we do our current setup. I got out of that franchise partly to stop making food mm -hmm. and uh, and stuff, and so our current setup free. It's been really nice because I can focus a lot more on making sure we have the right products in the store at the right time, being a more on the creative end and stuff like that. And I have this wonderful staff. My manager is incredible. Staff's incredible. So it's really been great. Um, this ministry that I'm on the board of, I'm literally the board member that is helping get all the buildings restored right now, but I have the time to do it. So, but I love it when I get to talk to other business owners, I love like this. I have these conversations in our store with people that own uh, businesses. I have these conversations when I'm visiting other stores and I love that because you're like helping each other out and you want to, you want to, um, I tell people, I was like, there's probably just as many people I've talked out of opening up a brick and mortar store as I've helped with the store they did open or they already had open because um, you want to help people. And it's like, you know, if you're about to go drop like 300,000, $400,000 on a franchise, or you're going to start your own thing or something like that, you might like, you could spend $5,000 for somebody just to sit down and like, again, be critical and look at things and it's not that hard, you know, I mean, literally like in a day, I can tell you if your business is going to work or not and where you maybe can save, you know, $25,000 a year by just doing some things differently or working with a different vendor. Um, I remember um, we uh, on the toy thing. One thing I did do is I actually in part of that research earlier is I called and talked to a um, a, uh, a national toy franchise you would franchise with kind of like I had been doing with chocolate and stuff. and uh, because I knew so much already, I wasn't just totally new on the whole run of business thing. 
I knew the right questions to ask. And so I remember there was like, um, you know, like I was looking at their numbers, like your POS system here, it's just $35,000 for your system. And I, and I knew I had a system and I knew what it could do inventory wise, back office wise. And so I already had a vendor that I knew I could work with and order in that was going to be like less than six grand, you know, and then um, there, I was like, you're shelving. It says like $45,000 you're shelving. And it's all this crappy peg wall stuff that looks like a KB toys and stuff. And I'm like sitting there going, well, I know I can spend like seven grand with Ikea and get this beautiful shelving. That's going to look better. And Again, those are just two areas where if I had done that or anyone that does that, they're putting themselves at the very start of the game, like, you know, $65,000, $70,000 in the hole that they have to dig out of as far as how much money they have to make every year on top of what they need to live on and uh, and everything. And it's just I'm always amazed people that do all those things. You're Gosh, if you had just come and talk to me. Uh, and uh, and everything. We're awesome. definitely we're definitely going to do a chocolate follow up, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna find an excuse. I love that. I love candy and chocolate. So yeah, thank you, Nate. Awesome. You take care. Have a great day, Ryan. You too. If you have a story to share, or you know someone with an inspiring journey, the Free Mind Podcast wants to hear from you. Submit your story or nominate somebody to be our next guest. Check out our website, thefreemindpodcast.com, and be a part of the conversation that truly matters. 